Hey everybody, on this episode of the Nerd Brand Podcast, we are talking about WordPress. We also have a very special guest, Laura Burnside, to discuss with us some interesting things about that. And we're talking about Indiana Jones and some theories. Was Indiana Jones necessary for the movie? Find out. Happy Friday, guys. Hey, yes. <laughs> it's Nerd Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Laura's holidays. been working with us. Yeah, <clears throat> Laura's been working with us at Nerd Brand and helping us in web and marketing the last few months and some design. So, Laura, the floor is yours. Tell us a little bit about yourself and share it with the audience. Okay. Um, well, I tackle anything pretty much from design and illustration to development. So, I'm kind of a little bit of a Swiss Army knife. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in illustration, a minor in, il- in advertising. And uh, that comes from Columbus College of Art and Design. When I went there, it was third in the nation. So, you know, you're supposed to say something like that. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> um, the, uh, the Internet was just kind of becoming a thing when I graduated. So the first decade of my career was mostly illustrating and designing promotional pieces. Um, but as the 2000s progressed, my clients started asking me for web design. So... Um, 2008, I bit the bullet and I took a full-time job as a junior front-end developer. And, uh, you know, because I, I felt it was important to actually learn to do something before you just kind of cobble your way through it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in that role, I was maintaining about 40 websites and um, most of them, I didn't even really know what language I was working in. Um, <laughs> I just would crack them open and kind of muddle around until I figured out the syntax and then I would fix whatever it was and it usually worked. <laughs> so oh, there you go. Uh, <laughs> kind, of, kind, of, kind of the Richard Branson methodology of, of doing things. Yeah. Basically, you know, if, if you don't know how to do something, uh, learn it as you go and don't worry about it. Just dive in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I broke a lot of things and from, from breaking things, I learned. I put them back together. <laughs> Yeah, um, but the guys on the web team were, they were wonderful to me. Um, They always made time for mentoring and uh, they would even shoot me chats of, you know, okay, so here's the, write this in JavaScript. I want you to do this and and send it back to me. And so they would just kind of random, you know, it was a random pop quiz (laughs) over (laughs) chat sometimes. (laughs) Um, But it, it taught me the foundations of, best practices for development and in in exchange i helped them with photoshop when they when they needed it um so i left there uh seeing as it was it was a junior position you know in order to move up you've got to move out and so um i moved over to help humana rebuild their flagship and um that's a a dot net enterprise cms and it's called team site and massive massive site lots of subdomains. Um, I learned way more than I wanted to about maintain, maintaining uh, GUID hierarchies in a spreadsheet. Um, and I learned very much that I am not a fan of .NET. <laughs> not my favorite thing in the world. Um, I, I don't know many people that have said, you know what, I want to go and develop on .NET. That seems interesting. I, I don't think any, yeah. I don't know of anybody that's done or said that. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the only people that like .NET are the IT guys that want everything locked down. Yeah, now, now that's just, <laughs> yeah. Now that's just that, Jason, we're going to get emails. Yeah, uh, that's okay. They, <laughs> they can send their hate mail. I'm all right with I it. I opened a can of worms. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the highlights of working with Humana, though, was I got to know Elle Waters, and she is an advocate for accessibility. And she, she sat right next to me. And so she rubbed off on me severely and her voice is the voice in my head as I'm coding these days. And, you know, it's always thinking about those with challenges and how they will interact with this page that I'm building and how I can make their life easier. Um, you know, cause you don't want to avoid that audience and you don't want to forget they're there. So, um, that was something that, that I really appreciated and took away from, from Humana. Um, once Humana.com was launched, um, I moved into building Drupal and WordPress sites for a small branding agency. Um, 
that was that was a lot of fun. That really was. Um, Drupal, I I have discovered. Um, make sure you get a, a veteran Drupal developer to put the back end together because there is a world of difference in whether it makes your life easy or whether it makes your life hard. Hmm. And if you've repurposed your IT guy to be a developer on your Drupal site, you're going to know it. (laughs) Um, (laughs) It's, it becomes much more challenging uh, in the, to edit it and handle a Drupal site if it's, if it hasn't been done well. Um, But then that brought me to um, KCTCS brought me in to redesign and rebuild their 16 college sites uh, that was another .NET experience. You can't get away from <laughs> this it. This time it was, this time the demon was called Sitecore. Mm, um, I know that one. Sitecore, it it even requires special certifications to touch the back end of it. It is a very complex CMS and reminded me how much I hate .NET. <laughs> um, they also had me redesign and build a, um, a site for, well, I guess it wasn't a redesign. They had me initially design and build a WordPress site for their brand new president. It was the second president of the system. And so I, I kind of felt good about that. Um, and then I worked for, you know, from then forward, I've kind of been working for marketing agencies in the area, um, which has familiarized me with structuring the back end for SEO and pandering to Google search algorithm And, you know, all the nuances of how the website supports marketing efforts. Um, So then most recently, I've been combining my illustration background and my development background and playing with animated SVGs, which is way too fun to be legal. That's that's really (laughs) what I enjoy these days. Um, But there's there's always something new to learn in development. Um, I I rarely ever say, oh, yeah, I I know that. I understand that. I'm always going to say, well, I'll give it a shot (laughs) because development is constantly moving. It's, um, you know, it's advancing faster than we can think. So um, I never claim to know anything. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's part of web is uh, we, we spend a lot of time. I mean, we're problem solvers. So. You have to think, um, you know, you have to think creatively in even what we do. And you have to be agile enough to be able to kind of find that problem and then pivot and, you know, make, yeah. make that adjustment. Sometimes you get into areas you've never touched before, but, you know, it's kind of what we do. We get into things, we figure it out, and we make it happen. Yeah, and just because you solved it last week doesn't mean that it's the best way to solve it this week. Right, yeah, exactly. Uh, that's, that's something that, that is also always changing. I think a lot of, uh, clients don't understand that because I mean, and it's not something they, they need to worry about because they're, they're worried about their business. They've got other things going on, but, uh, yeah, (laughs) it's, uh, we're there to kind of fix those problems behind the curtain, like the wizard of Oz. Yep. So you plugged my Kansas there. Just don't, oh, did I (laughs) just don't call me Dorothy. (laughs) Oh, you know, do you know how many times I got asked where Toto was in college? <laughs> I always said he's parked out in the parking lot. <laughs> parked in the parking lot. Okay. Yeah, sure. Windows up or down? <laughs> Windows up. Just like I get hate mail from the, you know, dog lovers and the cat lovers because, you know, that can get dangerous. Um so, but anyways, um, but yeah, well, thank you for joining us on the show. Um, I'm sure you're going to have a lot then to say, probably within uh, uh, the, the realm of the topic that we have here today about WordPress. So um, I guess we'll kind of start with uh, what do you all know about WordPress? And it's kind of putting a little bit, both of you on the spotlight there, but you know, what, what in the... Uh, years of your experience of doing this kind of work what's been your exposure to it and what are your thoughts well, the one thing you, one thing i learned from you was that 35 percent of the internet uh is populated with wordpress sites yep well of the top 10 million uh that's a important thing to kind of note because there are it's about 11 billion websites online so um but you know that top top 10 million we'll get into like um how many use it and who they are, but, 
Yeah, because I know, Mitch, you're kind of like, you're not web. You're more messaging, branding, advertising. I know um, enough to be dangerous. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> I think everybody does. Uh, WordPress is a very, it comes off as a very DIY type of thing. Uh, Laura, what's your opinion on it? Um, you know, when I, when I was first getting into WordPress, um, I thought it was the best thing since sliced bread. And then I kind of got soured on it because, um, I ran into some folks that weren't really using it the way it should be used. No, that um, never happens at all. (laughs) And, um, you know, you run into those clients that they just don't want to maintain it. They want to set it out there and leave it for years. And, you know, then you spend all of your time trying to figure out where that one script has been hacked in and deposited and it's sending out spam emails, Mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, I have spent days combing through websites that had some script that had been injected in the footer and it wasn't being picked up by any of the scans, but it was there nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I got a little soured on it for a while, uh, just because of that, but, um, it's, it's growing on me again, you know, because it's, um, I (laughs) bragging on you, Jason, when you have, (laughs) when you have a good, when you have a good foundation set up under it and you make it easy to, to be modular and, um, to manage, then it's a whole different world. But, you know, if you're trying to, you know, which a lot of my experience was you buy a theme, you break the theme, (laughs) and then you make your own theme, (laughs) you know? Yeah, that is not how theming works. Uh, It's really, it's really funny. I mean, I've had a lot of people, a lot approach me and say, um, oh, you can make a WordPress theme? And I kind of look at them and I'm like, yeah, and I know what's coming, you know, and mm. it, it's inevitably um, an understanding of the same as that. Well, I'm going to put together something that's quick and easy, or I'm going to take something already built and just kind of hack on it and then kind of give it to them and say, here's your website. It's the worst process in the world that anybody could go through to acquire a website build that they need for their business or as a company that sells websites to do. Uh, which I'm sure will get anybody out there that's listening to this going like, oh, how dare he? But um, the proof's in the pudding after doing this for like 10 years. I'm mostly employed because I fix other people's, you know, garbage uh, because they didn't really start from scratch. Um, They didn't develop a theme, you know, uh, that's their own to use. And by that, I don't mean like take another theme or take a child theme of another theme. (laughs) You sit and you grab (laughs) underscores, you take 2016 or whatever base theme WordPress offers that can be developed upon and you use that to create your theme. You, you make it Um, because they're like Legos. There's, you have to have these files and the HTML that's in there. Just write the HTML. That's what you know. You can do the PHP stuff later. You can refer to 2016 and underscores on how to put all that stuff in there and make it WordPressy if you want to say it that way. You're inevitably going to find those people though, that, um, you know, they give you a list of all the word WordPress themes that they've shopped online. And well, I like this feature Mm -hmm. of that one. And I like this feature of that one. And they seem to think just because it's WordPress that you can, you know, kind of plug and play, as you said, all of these themes together. And, you know, they don't understand that the back end of every WordPress theme is written completely different. And I can't tell you how many times uh, an account manager has gone on and purchased a theme, didn't even, you know, bring in the web team prior to purchasing the theme and saying, okay, here's this theme. Here's what we want to do with it. And when you, when you install it and crack it open, um, the things they want to do with it, it doesn't have the capability to do. It looked pretty on the outside, but the inside was crap. Yeah. Well, you know, and that's because a lot of the focus is on the outside. Um, You know, people don't know that what they're looking at visually is not what's actually how that is happening and how that's being displayed and why it's, you know, is completely different. And and then that's that's the disconnect. And so, you know, it's like we can all go to Walmart and look at a television and we see the televisions next to each other and 
many of us judge by two or three factors, uh, the cost of the television and the size of the television and the clarity of the television. And the last one is usually last. Most people Mm -hmm. go in and look at cost. And when they look at the cost, they're like, I can afford that. But then they look at the size of it and they're like, "Eh, I want it a little bit bigger because we all want something bigger. And then they kind of look at the one next to it, which is why it's sitting there next to it. A better version of that television is next to it. And the screen is clearer. And you're like, ooh, and you want that. Now, the problem is, even though they could be the same exact size television, just because they have a different slap label on it doesn't mean anything. The components that are in there are very, very different to give you that quality. Therefore, the price goes up. Many times people kind of look at the price and they kind of like, well, oh, yeah, you know what? I actually can afford that because I want that clarity. In web and themes, you really don't get to see anything side by side because one website in some people's minds looks exactly like another website. And so if they look at a commercial theme, they're kind of thinking, well, these all look the same. What's the difference, you know? Well, the difference is like you point out. I mean, it's what's on the back end. There's a lot of crap that's on the back end that's geared in commercial themes for a user, not a developer, not a marketer, and not a person that's in our industry that goes in and uses it. Like as, for example, a lot of them have um, option panels that allow you to change colors on the fly on the back end. Number one, Mm -hmm. that will grate against Mitch's nerves because (laughs) now you've broken the brand. So why would you give that even as an option in the back of your website? Um, Or invariably someone will, will use that little WYSIWYG and they will go in and they will make some line of text bold and bright red and flashing. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, they, you know I, I, I built car dealer websites for about a year. And you want to talk about, like, coming across the weirdest things and doing the strangest things. Um, it was an entire year of just dealing with that and understanding that. You know, there are levels of, of clientele and then there's people that have to have what they have to have because they, that's just what they can afford. Uh, and then there's this this thing where it's latched on to where I've got to have this because it'll lead to more sales. It actually doesn't. Nobody buys from a faceless entity. I mean, if you want your brand, you want something to stand out, it's not going to be your website that's going to do it. It's your brand, which is why we always back up to that. It's what are you saying to people? What do you look like? Put your face on it for crying out loud because nobody likes to buy from a faceless entity anyway. Um, And so it's kind of like focusing on those factors actually need to come to the front. Whatever you do for a website, if you start out with an affordable site, we can do that as a company, no problem. But then the moment you want to start stepping your game up and you want to get into marketing, you want to get into really elevating your brand to a specific audience, you're going to need an animal that can scale. And commercial themes don't really do that. You're kind of seeing the pinnacle of what the theme is made to do. But the moment you start trying to market with it, the moment you start trying to use it for other tools and other things, there's something that's happening that is not necessarily realized by the person that owns the website because there's this thing called cash. And it's not cash that comes into your bank account. It's cash on your machine. For you, it loads quickly because you're always going to it. But for that new user that's never seen you before, they're waiting for that site to spin up and you have less than seven tenths of a second to get that thing up in front of them or they go away. Mm -hmm. And so commercial themes are not really good about speed and performance, especially on low end servers that, you know, people can't really afford to buy a dedicated server or a virtual one. So there's been a huge uptick in those themes too, that um, they, they tout them as you can make them look, 15 different ways yeah you know yeah. so they'll they'll give you all the the different demos of oh this is all the same theme and for one low price you can have 15 designs mm-hmm. and then a novice gets in there and they're like well how do i make it do it yeah exactly there's no like like here's how to do that <laughs> so a lot of things will say well just click the button to install the demo content and you can see what you bought problem is your content is not that your copy, yes. your copy is not that copy. Your images are not that image. That's not your brand. That's not your color. There's nothing really about that demo or that website or that theme that you saw that you like that is actually going to work for your business because well, that's not you. You don't look well, like, you don't right. look like that. What, I mean, it's like everything else we do. I mean, everything about your, your branding needs to be a, re- a reflection <laughs> of you. And anything you buy off the shelf, uh, whether it's a, you know, a, 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 theme, a web theme or, or anything else, 
unless it's designed to forget, uh, designed to represent who you are and present what you're about specifically, it's not going to function for you. And we've already gone into one client and found like three or four avenues of revenue to bump them, you know, to get them almost another, you know, 10000 a month in sales online. And that's because of how they're not taking advantage of how sending traffic to that website, but also how that site's organized and handled. Um, and that's a big, that's a big thing with websites is, is you know, your content's got to be organized in a way that makes sense. Um, and, and, you know, themes are going to give you out of the box and we have it on our molecule demo. I mean, there's a home page, an about page, a contact page, a services page, but that's not necessarily maybe what you need. You know, I mean, it's, it, the things vary. So, you know, you're always going to need more than what you think when, when doing a site. Um, and you know, but you know, you, a website's never a one-time project once and done. Like you said, Laura, they want to kind of put it up and then that's it. But that's not how web marketing works, you know, so it's never done. Well, and Google is backing that up with their search algorithm that if your content, you know, as your content gets older, it starts slipping in the rankings. And then the next thing you know, you're on page three in the graveyard. Yeah. Yeah. And it takes a really long time to get up into the search rankings. It's not an easy task to do. There are uh, one of the things that I've noticed lately that's kind of the really, I, I hope Google deals with um, is the Yelps and the listing sites that are out there that absolutely mm. do absolutely nothing for somebody looking for a service because it's a listing site that basically replicates focused in on that particular term, all the keywords related to that search term they used. Um, and then when you do a search, you got to remember too, Google knows where you are. So it's honing in on your exact IP location that you are searching from and then serving you results closest to that IP location. And the same thing happens on your cell phone. Your cell phone has a specific MAC address. Every cell phone has a specific address. It's, unique to, it's a unique identifier to that cell phone. And that cell tower is constantly getting pinged by that phone where its location is at everywhere you mm -hmm. go 24 hours a day. So when you do a search from your phone, Google knows that information and uses that to serve you results mobily so that you can see what's near you while you're on your mobile device. So it, there's a lot that's happening that, um, that you know, kind of getting back into WordPress. Like a while back, Matt Cutts, who was um, head of spam and the algorithm unit, I guess, or mostly the spam unit at, at Google for many years, he did a WordCamp, a WordCamp conference, believe it or not, WordCamp has, is a conference for WordPress. And he was a speaker at it, and he said it fixes 80% of your SEO issues. Now, it's 80% of the mechanics is what he said. He emphasized the mechanics of SEO. It fixes 80%, not 80% of SEO. Um, <laughs> so that means that how, you know, WordPress, to get back to the, behind the curtain thing that happens. Um, themes have to have certain files because WordPress follows a template hierarchy that is the backbone of WordPress. One particular file is going to load before this one, before this one, before that one. And Google sees that structure of that theme and its files. And if you have a theme that's got like just a bunch of files, that robot's crawling each of those files in that directory for your theme. Every PHP file that isn't seen by users but generates your front-end page, every single one of those, even the ones you don't use, it's going to crawl through those. Now, that's going to affect your crawl rate because the Google bot's like, I keep wasting my time on something that's not even going on or even, even active. And that's a little hidden gem behind the curtain and free for everybody to kind of know and take and think about when you want to hire somebody to develop your WordPress website you know, not just the base they're going to build it off of, but how many junky templates do they use in order to just generate that one page? We use two, which is pretty standard. And one is because one contains what's called the loop, and the other one contains what is going to generate the output of the content aside from the actual 
content itself that is in the editor. So um, that's on pretty much every theme. It's called content PHP, and the other one's called single PHP for posts, page PHP for pages. So a lot out of themes I've seen over the years have page hyphen about, page hyphen contact. That's going right back. That's, that's reversing course in development with WordPress. That's actually, you might as well just have a static HTML page at that point in the file in, in the server. So there's just a all myriad of things that I'm sure I, I can get, I can get on this a little bit because of all the years of doing this and all the messes that I've cleaned up and, and spotting files and realizing like, you know, how many, it's like, I've, I've told, I said it before. It's like that old family guy episode where, Stewie's just, you know, mum, 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 mum. You know, don't do that to your server because that's what's happening. And every time a mum comes out, you know, your server's getting asked for something to return something. And they stack up like coins in a swear jar. And you eventually can't buy milk at the end of the week because you said the word crap too many times or it's rated R version. So that's kind of what happens and that's something you just have to think in mind. So when you're working with nerd brand, just a shameless plug, we envelop an entire, and I'm going to use a word that Mitch loves, yes. holistic strategy to web. <laughs> <laughs> warm, warm my Mitch's heart. Buzz words. Yes. Mitch's buzz. Yes. It's just a warm, <laughs> it's the warm Mitch's heart. Um, it's all about him. <laughs> well, not all. So I'll, <laughs> So I want to run through some facts about WordPress. You guys chime in on when you like. Um, so, okay, here we go. Cause I'm getting off my soapbox. All right. We don't want any, we don't want you to develop any weird twitches. Yeah. So yeah. No, yeah. It's Friday. So it's a happy day. It's the weekend. We made it to the end. Um, so WordPress, why we use it? Because it's got over 17 years behind it in investors, contributors, and users. So investors in 2019, Salesforce, that Salesforce, if you heard that name, yes, it's that Salesforce, gave $300 million to them at a $3 billion evaluation. WordPress is owned by a company called Automatic. Now, it's WordPress.org that we use because that's the one you get to play with and customize, not WordPress, but the themes and all do all kinds of fun stuff, you know. And that WordPress is what was, uh, you know, as a whole, both .com, .org, $3 billion. Can you imagine that? I mean, WordPress started in 2003. I would have never thought to see something like that evaluated that, at that high of a number. Hmm. Wow. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Automatic is the company with two Ts. Um, they own WooCommerce, Jetpack, WordPress VIP, and Tumblr for starters. Um, you can go to automatic.com and kind of look up at who they are, and if you really want to learn, like, what's behind this beast, because most people just don't know, and, uh, you know, that's fair, I mean, but you you kind of start to go, okay, this is not just a something that somebody can grab a copy of, make a change, and commit it, and the whole world has to deal with that. No, that's not how it works, so there is something behind it. Uh, to Mitch, you brought up 35% of the internet. The real numbers, it's the top 10 million post, most popular websites. Uh, so you have New York Post, Walt Disney Company, Washington Post, Rolling Stone Magazine, Sony Music, <laughs> and Glad Trash Bags. I just thought that one was funny. That, that, that covers, that covers <laughs> the spectrum. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... Um, you know, I got a bad rap, and I'm, I'm known for those listening to WordPress. They're like, well, what about security? Well, I'll, I'll touch on that here maybe a little bit later first time. But, um, you know, a lot of that's just panicky, misconfigured websites and servers and things like that, and people using 12345 as a password. So um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole nother podcast right there. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a whole nother episode. Um, or password. Don't use password as a password. Bad idea. <laughs> Even the cat in the background there that I just heard agrees with that. Yeah. Yeah. Mitch has got it hard there. <laughs> HR department's after him. <laughs> yeah, the HR department came They're around and whining. Uh, <laughs> oh, Zinga. Um, yeah. So, um, 
they do have 65% market share from other CMSs like Squarespace and Wix. Either one of you all have any opinions about Squarespace and Wix? Is that a can of worms to open? <laughs> do, you, do you have your bleep button ready? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I have some stories that I'll change the name to. I won't change the name of Wix because I just said it, but I'll, I'll change the name of the, the customer to protect their, um, you know, boo-boo. Because, Naivety? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it really was. They didn't know. And when they got into it, they were like, oh, it, it wants me to do that? Like, yeah, I can't really do that unless we change it to this um you know the the a la carte model of website development and sales is uh can be profitable if you've got a good platform but um you know we're not selling templates and we're not selling you know monthly hosting that's not what we do we sell strategies and that actually can you know make you money um so I don't know. Which do you guys think is superior in comparison to Wix and Square and Shopify and WordPress? Well, um, for me, <laughs> Wix is is probably you know if you if you want to make enemies with me, just you know start <laughs> touting Wix to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I might just do something. Um, yeah, it's. I find it, it's, it's one of those things that do-it-yourselfers really gravitate to it because it's cheap and uh, it's supposedly easy. And what they don't understand is that there's a handful of templates. Mm -hmm. You cannot customize those. Um, you, you pretty much are carbon copying someone else's website to stick out there with your own stuff on it. And it just, if you're really trying to make your brand, your um, brand, what you're that's I not the way to do it. To me, it's, um, from an SEO standpoint, it's not, it's not great either. Correct. No, no, it isn't. Um, it doesn't handle quite a few pieces, uh, at least Shopify. Um, we've, we've had to deal with Shopify quite a bit. And then, you know, I think as a platform to sell things on, I have no problem with Shopify, but again, the moment you start to engage with marketing or branding, Shopify has many, many problems. Um, yeah, Shopify is something that you, you build your website, you link to your Shopify store and you skin it to look like, like your website. Yeah. Um, yeah don't rely on it for your blog or your, you know, your page content, just, just let it do what it does. Right. Yeah. It's, it's just not a, it's not a great platform for, um, marketing yourself. Um, in that, you know, you, there's these apps that Shopify has that you have to install for every additional feature like SEO. And, mm -hmm it can cost $7 to $65 a month in addition to whatever you're paying Shopify now to just have that, which obviously you want that. Many Shopify themes say, oh, it's SEO ready. No, not really. Uh, Plus they have a pretty hefty fee on your sales, a, a percentage. Yeah, there is that that doesn't get, get caught. I mean, it's bad enough you have to deal with, you know, charges from invoices and pay everybody's got to deal with some sort of charge but yeah yeah there's a there's that <laughs> <laughs> because shopify has affiliate programs and you know i mean you've got your shopify yeah. through an affiliate they're going to get a cut um on each sale you make so um if you're okay with that great because you're probably making a ton of sales i mean there's some stores that make in a year, $120,000, and then we'll take them, we'll try to double that, um, which we'll have some case studies to prove that we're not just talking out our butts on that. We actually can do that. Um, but, you know, it's just uh, after a while, you start to realize, like, well, I made $120,000, but 30000 went to, like, that. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty big. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. So the app, but the add-ons are are a layer on top of that to take away from from that as well. I mean, 
seven dollars a month doesn't sound too bad but when you start adding on additional things in order to just to make it work as a marketing engine that seven dollars turns into you know seven to seven hundred depending on how many apps you add for additional features and functions and then in every app you add also impacts your site's um scale and its uh you know performance to serve pages to the you know your potential well, customers I mean, it's kind of the bottom line so uh um, there's really nothing off the shelf you can buy as far as building a website that's going to give you all of the things that you need to stand out and to reach your audience, but also to perform well from a structural standpoint. There's just nothing really off the shelf you can go and grab that's going to do all the things for you that you need it to do. You're going to pay a price somewhere along the way, whether it's in performance, whether it's in cost uh, or sacrificing actually reaching the audience you want to reach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it, that's where it has to, you have to kind of back up and say, okay, I, I got a Shopify site to sell product, but now I'm kind of in a situation where I need marketing to really make this work. And the marketing can't work because how the product looks. It doesn't matter what the theme is online or whatever you choose. If you put a picture of your product up there and it kind of looks, eh, then you know, you've got a problem that needs to be addressed that's not any way related to that website or platform. It's something else. Well, and I think any, any website out there or any brand out there that you see making traction in the marketplace, they're not using a $10 Wix site. No. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah. Yeah, some of those themes for, for you know, Wix or even like Shopify. Um, you know, for Shopify, I've seen $200. Now, there's WordPress themes that can cost that. And you're like, well, what's the difference between that and a $50 theme on, you know, Theme Forest or a free theme from WordPress? Well, first of all, for free theme from WordPress is very limited as well. I have to knock that because... You're buying a template. It's not custom made. And custom made goes. That's the that's the thing that I think always blows my mind is that the word template is used in conjunction with custom when it comes to web development and design and and, and doing this kind of stuff. It's not. Yeah. You've totally crossed into 100% custom, which means you need to be prepared budget wise for an increase in costs. Um, and that's just the way it is. So it's not something to just jump in with both feet and, not, and then look back at it later. It's something to really, really think about. And we try to walk you through those steps and what that's going to look like for your budget, which is why we have monthly installments that you can make on your site and, and the development because it's happening in conjunction with marketing services and as well as advertising services. So that's why it's all built around a retainer month to month. Um, your website's usually done within the first month, maybe up to 90 days, depending upon the build and communications and things like that. But at the end of the day, it's a monthly fee for, you know, six months, 12 months, whatever the size of the project is or the marketing that's required. Yeah, but then you, you also have to consider that a beta version. Yeah. Because you stick it out there and, you know, it takes a little while for it to make some traction. And then um, you may find that things about it aren't working. And you need to jostle some colors or change some text so you, or you maybe an image like just is not being received well. So your marketing mix. I mean, you're, you're always fine tuning. You're always adjusting. You're always sharpening your message. And uh, whether it's your website, whether it's, uh, you know, advertising, um, it's, it's just another piece of that puzzle. That's always being optimized. If you're, if you're doing it well, um, you know, a lot of a lot of businesses that I have encountered, um, they think that first off, they they gravitate to WordPress because oh, I can make my or... secretary do the website, <laughs> and you know, <laughs> on top of all of her other duties, or him, pardon me, um, <laughs> on top of their other duties, they get to handle the website and. Uh, Honestly, most people that I've seen that done to really don't want to mess with the website. It scares them. Mm -hmm. They don't want that responsibility. And two, they think, okay, we get the website done, we stick it out there, and 
suddenly money is going to start rolling in the door because right. that website just exists. Right. And if, if that miracle doesn't happen, then yeah. did, well, what well, did you let's see. Did you, agency? did you tell anyone the site was there? <laughs> did you let the, the greater <laughs> internet know that the site was there? Um, you know, what did you do to drive traffic? Um, yeah. Yeah. There's only like what? 2.5 billion websites. That's right. <laughs> And everybody just knew yours was there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a, uh, yeah, it, it, it's like putting, it's like putting a sign up on a billboard in the middle of a cornfield, nowhere near a highway. Um, you know, you, you have to do some sort of advertising. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, it, it, it's, that, that's the, that's the thing. Web Websites don't really fix your problem. Um, They're just, so right. they're, they're you just know, they're they're a you vital have to have something part else of the mix of elements you need to market your brand effectively. It's it's becoming increasingly the most important because as we've seen during this uh, COVID nineteen uh, situation, businesses that had a strong web presence and a mm-hmm. strong ability for their site to interact and and facilitate sales with their customers have fared far better than people who maybe treated it like an afterthought. Yeah. Right. Or the ones that are going into um, hibernation mode and they're trying to s- save money or in their eyes, stop the bleeding. And so they, you know, while they're not able to bring in an income, they stop all their marketing and, you know, then they wonder why everything just takes a complete nosedive when they have to try to maintain customer interest during this time so that once everybody is out and moving around again, that their business will revive faster because it's still in the top of mind of those that they were marketing to beforehand. (laughs) Oh, that famous phrase, top of mind. (laughs) (laughs) Did I say another Mitch buzzword? Good thing this isn't a drinking game. <laughs> you don't see what you don't see what's already. in this class. Buzzword. <laughs> yeah, Mitch would be like buzzword, buzzword, floor. No, but seriously, I mean, there's, there's an old adage in, in the advertising industry: time, when times are good, you advertise. When times are hard, you advertise more. Um, you want to drive more traffic. You don't want if 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 the water faucet. If you're thirsty, and all you're getting is a trickle out of the faucet. You don't just tighten it and turn it off harder. You you turn it on more and to let out more water. Um, it's and and again, what we've it's been illustrative to this whole situation that uh, having a vibrant, effective, you know, client facing website has been has been a key for businesses that have managed to to stay afloat. Um, during this crisis, it, 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 I don't, I don't think you'll ever see a clearer example of why it's important than we have right now. Yeah, I, I've been seeing a lot of these email marketing campaigns right now. Um, you know, not so much marketing on the web, but I've seen more email marketing campaigns. And you know, what our company is doing to support you during this time, you know, and it just sometimes it's. Um, it kind of seems a little bit out of place, but there are companies that are doing a really great job of that and saying, you know, Hey, we're not out there right now, but we'll be here now, as I, soon I think, as I think everything is out life. and about again. So let me know you're still, still alive. They are. They, they want to know that society yeah, they want to know that society is not collapsing if, if around them while you, they're stuck and, at home. You know, web and like you said, email marketing um, uh, are extremely valuable in, in kind of in some way you're injecting some level of normalcy into people's lives saying, it's OK. We're still here when you need us. Whatever you need, let us know. Get in touch. We're here to help you. That's what people want. That's what people are looking for right now. And not only does that bode well for them in the current situation, I think it bodes well for them. As we go forward, it's going to build even more brand loyalty uh, for those companies that said, hey, you know what? They let me know they were still around. They, they, they uh, reached out to me with, with things I need and with, a, with messages that were 
that I found receptive. So, you know, going forward, I, I'm going to stick with them even more. Right. How often have you heard somebody say in the last two to three weeks, boy, I sure hope X company is still making it when, when this is lifted so that I can go and shop there or I can go take my business there. Um, yeah, but I'll be really exactly. disappointed if they went under during this time, you know, so it, it kind of injects a little bit of hope that everything isn't collapsing. Yeah, like I, said, I think people yeah. are looking for some, some level of, yeah. give me, give me something familiar. Give me something I can, I can kind of hang on to. Give me something I can, I can rely on. Um, and if they're, fa- if, if, if their favorite brands, of yeah, choice something to look to forward to, for, yeah. then, you know, so much the better. Yeah. Right. Well, speaking of, since you guys brought up the whole virus yes. thing, Mitch, you want to uh, talk about our digital we reboot offering, package we got? Uh, to businesses that either may have found when the virus hit that maybe they were a little, maybe not as prepared as maybe they could have been to accommodate uh, their customers online, or maybe customers, you know, businesses that have been able to maintain to some level, but could really improve upon their their web presence and their messaging to, to reach the customers. We have a, we put a package together that uh, would uh, develop a, uh, a more effective web presence for them and would offer uh, social media, a social media package um, through our uh, social media partner, uh, Go, uh, Go Social, um, that works together that gives you a, a, a package of resources that will help you to, uh, more effectively reach your customers during this time and something you can grow on once things get back into some level of normalcy. That way uh, you'll be better prepared to, to handle an influx of business. And if a situations like this, God forbid, should arise again, you'll be well prepared um, in that eventuality as well. Um, we are hoping that this is something that, um, you know, like you said, can, can help folks. I mean, it's, um, there's a lot of ways that we can um, handle uh, you know, with the offer on three months, six months, 12 month commitment, because if you're not, it's not a one-time charge. It can't be, uh, if it is, then you're not going to really get the value out of it because it has to be ongoing. You've got to build this up. And if you've not, you know, done that in the past, I mean, it's an investment that to take a look at, to try to make, I think at minimum, you know, it needs to be something of around three to six months in order to see some effectiveness of anything you do with your marketing. Um, you've got to build that audience. Uh, most, most advertisers, marketers will tell you that, you know, it's kind of like, I, I equate it to like throwing a party, you know, I mean, you're sending out invites and you're hoping somebody will show up. Well, <laughs> if you do it once, you're probably not going to anybody to show up. So it's a numbers thing. So you've got to k- keep doing it and you got to keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And then more people will show up and they will tell their friends and on and on it goes. Marketing is made to attract that audience and but you know it's not something that you can just do one time and then okay well i spent the money why am i not getting anything out of it well you got to keep investing so we're hoping that we can release these packages and then discuss with people and then uh you know take that approach and then see what happens and hopefully get them some traction um that they've not had before because i know that we can do that easily uh all right and just and just to give you just a kind of so a a, a thumbnail sketch of, of what the uh what we call the small business digital reboot offers. Um, it, it includes the most valuable marketing tools that your business needs to launch quickly, but effectively uh, and utilizing your web presence and actionable marketing campaigns. You get social media management um, of up to two social media channels and a free audit of, of one channel, um, a five page WordPress site, um, it contains your logo, the content, uh, conversion tracking tools for lead generation. And you also get uh, SEO and digital uh, analytics suite uh, so that you can uh, monitor your site traffic and uh, optimize your website for search engines. Um, you get all of that in one neat little package. And the prices start at, uh, like uh, as Jason was talking about, uh, at $2,000 for uh, as a retainer to get all of those services. I don't know where else you could go today um, to another you know, branding agency or a, a web, web agency that could offer you that suite of resources um, with our expertise at, at a price, anything like that. 
not that we want to be a low price leader, but we understand the, the pressures that businesses are under right now. We understand um, money's tight and where you put your money is important. And we think what this offers you as a business um, isn't just something that addresses it and out, but it offers you a strategy you can grow with. But it's, it's, you're not biting off more than you can chew. Okay, cool. Thank you, Mitch, for telling us the latest news on that. We'll have video. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think that we've kind of drilled in about, and definitely I've done a bit of preaching about WordPress and, and bad decisions, good decisions that could be made that, again, no fault to the people that make them because they don't know. I mean, you know, as a business owner, your job is not a web developer. Your job is not to, you know, know everything about, you know, Ford Motor Company. Your job is to know everything about what you do, and, and that's kind of that. And I think a lot of these things just sidetrack. So we hope that, uh, you know, if you're thinking, if you're listening to this and you're thinking of us, uh, give us a call. We're happy to help, you know, navigate through that, take that burden and that stress off of you from, you know, having to deal with all of that because it is a lot. It's a lot of buzzwords. Let Mitch get excited about the buzzwords. <laughs> Mitch's word of the day. Yeah. Mitch's word of the day will be buzzword. And that could be the name of the podcast or something that we put in the title because it said buzzword an awful lot. If I keep saying buzzword, Thanks it's going to be one of the titles buzzwords. of the podcast. This episode, that is. Yeah, buzzword. Buzzword, 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 Indiana Jones. That's how we segue, <laughs> kids. So, because it is nerd and brand, and one of the most popular brands in film is Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Now, there's been th- four, uh, like four of these, or five, is that right? There's one we don't, we don't want to talk about one, but we have to acknowledge there's been five, I believe. There's Raiders, Temple, Temple of Doom, Doom which was awful. awful. There was... Uh, Yes, it was. It was just so that Steven Spielberg could give his wife a job. Sorry. That... There were five. Yeah. Yes, there were five. Yeah. And uh, so then after that was yes. what? What was it? Temple, it, it wasn't uh, Last Crusade, Lost was it? Art, Temple of Doom. Okay. Last yes. Crusade, and then. It... And yeah. Now you, you want to talk about bad. Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Okay. And then, and then Indiana Jones 5. Yeah, that one's in development. Can you believe that? I don't know if that's just not. It's just no. Stop. <laughs> just, you know, it's like we got him back as Han Solo. Can he just not? I don't think anyone wants to see. It's Indiana fine, Jones Harrison. You don't have being to be chased it. by Nazis in a wheelchair. <laughs> no. <laughs> Seven cutscenes for a fight scene because he's like eighty. That's just not going to work. <laughs> So, anyways, um, well, maybe he's like Yoda. Mm. <laughs> no, don't cross he the looks, streams. <laughs> looks all looks all decrepit, and then suddenly he's like swinging around the room, <laughs> wielding his lightsaber. Well, one of the things about Indiana Jones is, if you watch Raiders of the Lost Ark, I mean, it's still to this day like uh, at the top of the list because it's always I, I know it was the first one, but I still think it's got it still holds water. It's still a really good movie. It's it's a really good marketable brand and 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 you know and nerd culture and everything and but you have to acknowledge that if Indiana Jones was not in the film it wouldn't have mattered what happened because the outcome still would have been the Germans getting the ark and opening it up dying from it and then that's it and the ark would have just been sitting in the desert in the middle of nowhere nobody would have ever known it's sitting there like that would have been how the movie would have went if you took Indiana Jones and his love interest out, Miriam. You know, I you um, know, as 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 many, sorry. Ta- as many times I've seen the movie, I never Spoiler. that way. Yeah. And I no, no. I mean I mean Are you serious? Um, You've never heard of that? It never occurred to me that well wait. If he just let the Nazis to left them to their own devices and let them open the ark, the same outcome would have happened. Or what if they'd actually gotten it to I don't know, to uh to uh, to Berlin and done it. It, it, they would have gotten rid of Hitler and the whole Nazi cabal. I mean, the whole war would have ended right there. Uh huh. Yeah. So really, the true, <laughs> yeah. the true bad. Darn that Indiana is, Jones got in the easy. way. Yeah. So they could, could have ended ended the war years sooner. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, you never know. Yeah, 
Yeah, because, I mean, when they stopped in the desert to open it up, that was not probably the place they thought that they would be doing that. They just did that because Indy kept interfering and the whole chase scene with the tank or whatever and all that. And it was just like, oh, well, we're here. You know, it's kind of like... <laughs> It's kind of like going for a drive and being like, well, there's a, oh, there's a fast food joint. Well, while we're here, let's get some burgers and fries. You know, I mean, that's kind of the way that I kind of felt like how that happened. I don't think that destination in the desert was planned. I mean, I could be wrong, but there was something in the film that wasn't included. And that was it uh, is. the it theories. Is. Now that Mitch's mind is blown by the fact <laughs> that, you know, Indiana Jones was completely useless for the film to turn out how it did. Um, <laughs> and if you're listening and that's you right now, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but in you know here's a theory in the film so we said at the beginning of the podcast okay what's the theory how, what how did he know to tell Miriam oh, himself like and close and your when eyes when don't look they're tied up you know shut your eyes don't look how did he know that so what are your all's theories don't look at the notes from the podcast well it, it, what are to your some degree, what do you just think? simply implies that, that Indy through I guess through his his archaeological acumen and things he's learned along the way that he somehow had some, you know, some impression or some inkling that something like that was going to happen. You know, what, what, what other answer could it be? Eh, kind of, but there's actually, okay. you do that. Well, I'll tell you <laughs> <laughs> in the final cut of the film, they didn't actually include a scene with Indiana Jones talking to this sage guy. And I'll include the link to this on the post of the podcast that will be out next week. Uh, this episode will be up today uh, as you're listening on May 15th. Uh, so at least I hope you're listening as it comes out. If you're listening to it later, then, you know, you can find this stuff later. Um, anyway, he told me, he said to him, if you touch the ark, you die. If you look at the ark when it's opened, you die. Well, like it was in the movie. I mean, and that's, that's, but they didn't in, make it into the, the final cut. They were told so, uh, not to touch it. Right. Only, the, only these guys can yeah. carry it and don't, don't touch, touch it. it. And yeah. Only stay away. And uh, for the notes, I mean, I've got that. It's uh, 1 Samuel 6.19. He smote the men of... <laughs> Gesundheit. The, the shoot myths, Michigan, Myrna, Myrna. <laughs> Be because they had looked in... Yeah, well, you know, I mean, obviously in the Bible, I mean... You know, there's always like the the jib, the, <laughs> the Hittites, the mini bites, the mosquito bites. I mean, All there's the always ice. like something, you know, so you just kind of have to like murmur. Yeah. So if you mumble through, you know, what it is that the name is, you sound still scholarly. Um, so anyways, that's your nerd tip for today, folks. Dun, 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 dun. Um, <laughs> the other ones in Second Samuel is as when you came to the threshing floor, Uzziah put forth his hand on the Ark of God, took hold of it. Uh, basically, long story short, uh oh, it's gonna fall over. So, I'll grab it. That's you right. Know. So even so they got it. Not so a Levite. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they got it. You know, yeah, it. yeah, they got it. So, but you know, essentially though, for the plot to work, it was in the movie, but it was cut out of the movie. And we talked about in previous podcasts about Star Wars and how. George Lucas made a great film. I believe this, we did this in our second podcast episode where we talked about video editing and all that and how that, you know, it was a great film, but it was Lucas's wife that made it really great because she edited the film. He shot it. He came up with the idea. His edit was garbage. Even Steven Spielberg said so. But she was the one that came in after that initial preview for that small group to look at redid it and gave us what we have today. And then if you look at the remake of Star Wars, well, not the remake, it was the re-edit. Lucas likes to edit things and edit and edit and edit and edit and don't do that. Um, he ended up including in a scene that was the exact same scene that had just happened. I mean, the, the same, the same, that thing same twice. act already. Yeah. It was, it, it's not the same scene in that it was the same two characters. It uh, the scene that was duplicated and, and that or that George put back in was when Han Solo and Chewbacca were when the Millennium Falcon was parked, basically. Um, and so he was walking over and then Jabba the Hutt walked up. Yes, Jabba walked. Because there's like another cut after that where he added the animation of took that actor out as Jabba the Hutt and put in a smaller <laughs> version of the sluggish Jabba because of CGI. But in before that third cut, yeah, I know, right? It kind of gets ridiculous after a while, George. Stop it. 
um, you know, he, the act, there was an actor and the actor walked up and the dialogue they had is the same dialogue that occurred in this earlier scene between, um, so other actors and Han Solo, I think. So it was wow. the same exact dialogue that happened. Never so lived. it was a dupe. It was a dupe clip. Yeah. So, yeah. So you go. So now, now everybody's going to go back and go, I'm going to watch Indiana Jones again this weekend. And then I'm going to cry because Jason was right. And then I'm going to go back. And I'm going to watch George Lucas's second edit and then go, holy crap. <laughs> there was a dude that played Jabba the Hutt in Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> why does everything end with people crying because you were right <laughs> i don't i can't help it if stuff is online you don't believe me go google it it's what google he is just for. reports the news he doesn't not make my it. fault don't make it my fault <laughs> uh, yes exactly and that's exactly what this has been it's been you know we didn't really do the nerd news this time around the podcast we were you know because we have a guest on we know we, we there's some things that we have to throw out and take in but I want to say that if you're listening to the show, I appreciate you listening to it. Please like, subscribe, follow it. You can go to nerdbrandagency.com slash podcast. Check out the latest episode there. Find previous episodes and listen to them. If you have a question for us, please head there. Send us a question that you'd like for us to read on the podcast. We didn't really have time to get, to get any of that today. But, um, you know, we're always uh, willing to kind of do that. If you want to, if you're a business owner, leave your business there. We'll plug your business for you. Thank you, Laura. But uh, thank you both for being with us today. And uh, yeah, especially you, Laura. Oh, you're welcome. It was a blast. <laughs> yeah, we try to make these a little bit fun. Um, you know, we'll, we'll uh, you know, as the show continues on, we're getting back to our, our nerd roots. The whole Indiana Jones thing is uh, something I want to save for the last, that, you know, last. Typically, we t- take a brand that's in nerd culture and we kind of look at what it's doing right now as far as marketing goes. And it's advertising, and we just start. That's the discussion of the show. We kind of take that and tear it apart, and get into that, and just focus on that instead of you know talking about things like WordPress and SEO because everybody does that on their blog. But <laughs> during COVID nineteen and the quarantine, you got to take what you can get. <laughs> um, so, but I think in June um, we'll we'll start seeing things get back to normal. I think we've already started seeing, um, you know, like. Uh, uh, Black Widow, and many other films, Tenet, and the things like that. So I'm hoping that if not by next week or the week after, our podcast will be discussing uh, Black Widow and Tenet uh, as, uh, you know, topics, perhaps. So. so tune in next time for the Nerd Brand Podcast, and remember, keep your nerd brand strong. <laughs>